part. And uh, hello, everyone, for listening in to us today. Uh, we have today a crucial, important, and very technically in, uh, difficult point of sanctions. And um, we will start with um, some introductionary speeches, and then we will go to the four key speakers who, from different industries, and coming from different experiences to talk about how they deal with sanctions in their day-to-day -day work and giving us practical advice what to be aware of as either clients or professionals who deal with UK, Russia, businesses and trade. And um, it's my pleasure to invite first for the um, opening uh, speech for uh, Trevor Lewis, Director of UK Trade and Investment Russia. Trevor, over to you, please. Yeah, thanks very much indeed, uh, Svetlana. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good morning, uh, depending on where you're sitting. So on behalf of the Department for International Trade and, and the British Embassy in Moscow, I'm very glad to welcome you today to uh, the next in this series of online law events. It's in fact the third webinar we've done within the sort of umbrella of UK-Russia legal discussion. Uh, and as you know, today it's uh, dedicated to sanctions. Uh, in, in a world of uncertainty, especially challenged by COVID-19, confidence in the robustness of our legal institutions, the application of the rule of law and access to high quality independent legal advice is, is more important than ever. And it's why I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to speak today and to support the work that legal professionals are doing to achieve that. Uh, at the British Embassy, we're keen and, and want to help to continue to build bridges between the UK and Russian uh, professionals in the legal sector uh, through virtual English Russia Law Week and the England Russian Law Days, which we held in the Katrinburg. We've also hosted a live panel for women in law agenda uh, recently, which went very well. Uh, I'm hoping, as, as many of you are, I'm sure that uh, certainly by the spring and, and certainly by this time next year, we might be able to sort of, you know, start doing these events, reimagine them uh, and remember how we did them in person, because uh, it's obviously been a, a long period for all of us. But once we can get back to those in-person events, I think that will be really great news. As so we're talking about sanctions today, uh, the uh, legal colleagues uh, on, on, online will be pleased to know that within sort of the, the team in Moscow, we do get a lot of uh, inquiries about sanctions and we also always say to our companies, well, really, you need to seek legal advice. Whatever you're doing needs to be watertight. We can offer some very general advice because in some cases, companies approach us where it's clearly a sector that's not impacted by sanctions. But once it gets a little bit tricky and into gray areas, then we always say you must take legal advice to make sure uh, you're watertight on this. I think the thing is with certainty, uh, sorry, with sanctions, of course, is that there's lots of uncertainty and indeed, I think some misunderstanding. So I'm pleased that uh, uh, after I've spoken and uh, after I've handed over to Alpha some more general comments, we're going to hand over to some legal experts who will be able to really share some insights with you, which I'm sure will inform you. Uh, and I think that's very, very important. So we'll be happy to do that and uh, wish everybody. General comments, Alf, over to you. Um, thank you very much, Trevor. So um, Alf, uh, Alf Torrance is Executive Director of Russo British Chamber of Commerce, who supports UK Russia trade as well. And uh, just a small admin point that uh, for anyone who uh, wants to hear this seminar in Russian, there is a button at the bottom, like a globe button with a language option. So please feel free to turn in uh, turn to the language you prefer. And I'll go over to you, please. Great. Uh, Svetlana, thank you very much and um, welcome to everyone. I'm delighted to have been invited to make some opening remarks for the latest in the series of DIT organized legal webinars. As, as Trevor said, this is already the third. Um, I'm Alf Torrance, Executive Director of the Russo-British Chamber of Commerce, and we've partnered DIT for this excellent series of legal discussions, which aims to explore some of the complexities of the legal landscape as it pertains to Russian and UK business matters. Um, as always, a big thank you to Trevor, Director of DIT Russia, uh, Ludmilla Stepanova, Team Leader, and of course, Anna Rosanova, Senior Trade Advisor at DIT, for organizing these excellent events, which I know are really well um, received and appreciated by both audience and um, speakers. As, as I've said, I think on each occasion that, that I've um, made some opening uh, remarks, British Chamber, as a British Chamber, we recognize that a strong legal system brings good business practice. And in a challenging political relationship, legal collaboration is an area where we, more can be done between the two countries. And this is, of course, why we support this initiative so wholeheartedly and are so enthusiastic about it. Of course, uh, we're talking about sanctions today, which is 
as we all know, an extremely important area. Um, and again, as a British business organization, we, a bit like DIT, are often asked as to how the UK's position differs on sanctions, having left, having recently left the EU, and now sanctions being in force under the UK Sanction and Money Laundering Act of 2018. I don't think the differences are generally well understood by a lot of businesses out there, and hence why discussions and webinars like this, this one today, are so important. Of course, we're here to discuss sanctions when and where they do apply. Um, again, as a business organization, we spend a lot of time explaining to businesses that are looking at Russia as a potential market that sanctions are both targeted and very specific. And we find it depressing how many businesses think that sanctions are enforced in a very general way and they affect everyone, which, as we know, is not the case. And that, that's a myth we spend a lot of time trying to dispel. However, we're here to discuss when they are in force, and as, as we all know, it's a very, very complex area, and uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing our panel of experts um, uh, dissect and unpick some of the complexities. And I'd like to finish by thanking the moderator, Svetlana, and, and our panel of experts for giving up what I know is very valuable time to contribute to this extremely important topic, which I know will help a lot of our businesses out. So thank you very much, and over back to you, Svetlana. Oh, thank you so much for that. And, and now we can start the seminar in terms of the getting into the nitty gritty of how sanctions work. And I'm very pleased to say, I think we have an exemplary panel today and uh, pretty much majority of the panel I know personally, and they work in uh, leading firms, uh, not just law firms, we have the audit auditors firms here. We have people specializing on compliance. So I hope the listeners will be able to um, get the real benefit out of this level of experts we have today. And at the end of the presentations for them, we have Q&A session where we will be able to ask your questions. So please make sure that you uh, write them down and they come, come to you. So I will start with introducing Greg uh, Full Love at partner at Osmond Clark. Uh, it's a brilliant UK law firm. Uh, Greg uh, will tell us and give us an overview on how sanctions work. So I think this is a first step in stone in terms of understanding the today's subject. Greg, over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed for that uh, warm introduction. I'd just like to say it's a pleasure to be here talking to you this morning, and my thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Now, as a first step, I am going to check that I am going to be able to bring up some slides. Um, I don't think I can. So if I, oh, look at that. That is absolutely wonderful. Bang on time, some slides to help us through. All right, I'm going to pick up on something that Alf said, which is there are a lot of misconceptions out there about sanctions. Now, if you're listening in and you're not quite sure what sanctions are, how they might apply to your business. Fear not. Before we continue today with the rest of the presentations, I'm going to give you an introduction to the basic concepts. I'm going to focus on UK and EU sanctions, but I will mention US sanctions. You're gonna hear more about them as the, as the day progresses. But let's start with the basics. So if you're going to understand sanctions, the first thing is, well, well, what are they? Well, fundamentally, they're non-military foreign policy tools, and they're adopted either by states, such as the US or the UK, or international organizations like the United Nations or the EU. And they're a way, often, of voicing displeasure about the way a certain state is acting, and they're there to influence behaviors. Now, as Alf said, and this is a critical point, when many people think about sanctions, they think about trade embargoes. You cannot deal with this state or anybody in it. Now, those country-wide sanctions are very, very rare these days. So if you forget everything else that I say, try and hold on to that first point at least. In the United States, you do have examples of these countrywide bans, so Iran, Cuba, 
But elsewhere, it's all about targeted, or as they're sometimes known, smart sanctions. Now, trade controls are a type of sanction, and they are very common, import-export. We're not going to be talking about those in any depth today. You'll also hear about travel bans. They're another type of sanction. So a person cannot come into your territory if subject to a travel ban. But what I suspect we'll be really focusing on today are financial sanctions. And these are the targeted sanctions which day to day most affect your business. Now, financial sanctions are measures which focus on the assets and economic resources of an individual or an entity which has been identified and listed as a sanctioned person by a state or an international organization like the EU. I'll come back to the detail in a minute, but a financial sanction is effectively an asset freeze. If you are um, subject to a sanctions regime, so if you're an EU or a UK entity, you have to abide by those sanctions regimes, you cannot effectively transact with an entity which is on a sanctions list. Now, what are these lists? Where are they? Fear not. They are easy to find, they're publicly available, and they're often referred to as consolidated lists. So um, the US has its OFAC list. You can go online and check whether an entity is um, sanctioned there. The UK, the EU also have these sanctions lists. And day in, day out, companies are checking against these lists to make sure that counterparties in their transactions are not sanctioned. And for, the, uh, for bigger companies with um, a greater number of transactions, there's sanctioned software which, are a, is, a, 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 which is able to um, do these checks for you automatically. I think some of my colleagues will come back to that particular thing later on. Now, why do sanctions matter to you? Well, there are a number re of reasons, but fundamentally, say you're an, a US, a UK, an EU entity, then if you fail to comply with a sanctions regime, you could be subject to criminal civil penalties. And those could be very, very serious fines. In fact, that is the most common. So if you are a Russian entity, and you're transacting with European, EU, uh, European or uh, UK entities or US entities, you have to be very aware of the sensitivities that they will have as they do their sanctions checks, because sanctions now has got really to the top of the agenda in many companies. And they are treating their sanctions policies with all the care, all the importance that they do their bribery and money laundering policies. So it is an area which is a growth industry really for compliance. So moving on, I said I'd come back to the detail of financial sanctions, and that's what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to take the EU and UK financial sanctions as an example. Um, it has to be said, although each sanction uh, regime is a little bit different, there are great similarities. So you would find um, very similar provisions in, in US law as well. But anyway, if a person is listed, then if you're a UK or an EU entity, you are prohibited from dealing with funds or economic resources which are owned, held, or controlled by that listed person. And the, the phrase which you often hear is a designated person. So they've been designated on the list. If you know or you have reasonable cause to suspect that you're dealing with funds or economic resources of a designated person. And then the second prohibition is that 
you cannot make funds or economic resources available directly or indirectly to a designated person, so to a sanctioned person. Again, if you have reasonable cause to suspect that you're doing that. Now, if you just step back from that, that is a pretty awesome prohibition. If a sanctioned person sends you any money, you can't deal with it. What does that mean? Well, for many of my clients, it means you have to freeze those monies immediately and make a report to the regulator. The regulator here in uh, the UK is the Office of Financial Sanctions Implementation. If, on the other hand, um, a sanctioned entity wants to transact with you, you simply can't do it. You can't make funds or economic resources directly available to them. You can't send them unless you're licensed to do so. And also, you can't do it indirectly. So a sanctioned entity says, I need 100,000 uh, as part of this transaction. You can't do that. You also can't do it indirectly by sending 100,000, let's say, to a company in uh, wherever it may be, uh, you're an African subsidiary, which is not subject to EU and UK sanctions, and then ask them to send it on. That is simply not allowed. That, is an, that would be indirect, and also, as we'll see in a moment, possibly an example of circumventing sanctions, which is just as bad as actually um, uh, a, direct, um, uh, a direct breach of them. Now, in terms of who has to comply, if we take the EU and the UK as an example, um, this will apply to all nationals or corporate in, uh, entities incorporated in the EU or UK, wherever in the world you are doing your activities. So I always think of, of, of sanctions regimes, they're like a little devil or something on your back. They follow you around, okay? Um, in terms of non-EU UK persons, um, they are subject um, to the restrictions, but only to the extent that the activity or the conduct takes place in the EU or the UK. Now, just a brief word which might help um, in terms of the relationship between the EU and the UK post-Brexit. I'm not going to go into the politics of this, but in terms of sanctions, um, up until Brexit, obviously the, the UK was um, part of the EU, and so EU sanctions uh, were fully applicable. There is now in the UK a separate um, sanctions uh, regime, which is administered within the UK. But effectively, we imported all of the old EU stuff when we left um, due to Brexit. And so the two regimes remain very, very similar. However, if you're doing business um, in the EU and the UK, you will need to check both lists um, going forward. So they're separate regimes, though very, very closely connected. I think there was a question coming through on that. So hopefully that will um, help deal with that particular point. Now, if you're going to remember another thing, I hope you remember all of it, but I'm trying to bring out some of the main points. A critical thing is to know your counterparty. So know if you could possibly be dealing with a designated person. Now, the simplest starting point, of course, is um, to have a look at these lists, the consolidated lists. And if an, if an entity, an individual is on those lists, well, that's a designated person. But it gets a little bit more complicated than that. Because sanctions will also apply to entities which are owned or controlled, all right, by designated persons, whether directly or indirectly. And if you're dealing with a company which is owned or controlled, 
by a designated person, then effectively you're deemed to be dealing with a sanctioned person. Now, across a, a number of sanctions regimes, this is often talked about in terms of being the 50% rule. So in summary, an entity is treated as being owned by a designated person, where if it were a company, let's say, more than 50% of the shares or the voting rights in that company are owned directly or indirectly by a person, an entity on a sanctions list. And that's a fairly straightforward proposition. Um, the indirect thing is quite important because um, you could have a chain of companies and at the top, a sanctioned individual. If ultimately that sanctioned individual or entity owns indirectly 50%, in the company at the bottom of the chain with which you're transacting, you'll still be dealing with the sanctioned entity. So the point again, know your counterparty, do your due diligence, understand how the structure works. Now, we mentioned this before, um, it's another key point. Sanctions are there to be complied with. The regulators are not interested in clever structuring. In fact, where you know that um, in a particular transaction, a sanctioned entity will benefit financially, if you enter into a whole number of structures which are aimed at obscuring that so that you don't deal directly with the entity, but some subsidiaries do, or there's some clever structure which allows the deal to go ahead, you may find that you are caught by this non-circumvention rule. The regulator will say, you knew what was going on, you knew what you were trying to do, and therefore you have breached sanctions. So before thinking about any sort of clever ways about dealing with um, a, a sanctioned entity, take some legal advice because you could end up in very, very hot water indeed. Penalties for non-compliance I mentioned earlier. Now OFAC in the States, which is the, the, the regulator and enforcer there, it has a history of intervention, huge fines. You'll all have heard about that. In the UK now, the Office of Financial Sanctions Implementation is beginning to gear up. And they have um, issued already a whole number, uh, load of fines. The biggest, I think, still to date is that um, which related to Standard Chartered, which was caught out for multiple infractions of the Russian sanctions. Um, and they got an incredible fine of 20.4 million. More recently, another infraction of um, Russia-related sanctions um, involved TransferGo, which is a sort of fintech entity. Now, they made, I think it was um, 7,000 pounds worth of transfers to a Russian bank, which was, um, which was on the sanctions list. And that's not, uh, you would say, a huge amount of money. And in fact, the transfers were to accounts held by the Russian bank of individuals who were not sanctioned. Because the money went to the sanctioned bank, they were caught. And when you look at Offsy's um, uh, decision on this, what you'll see very quickly is that they were very, very scathing about transfer goes lack of structures to catch sanctions issues. And that is why, as you'll hear from some of my colleagues, having a policy, having procedures which um, mean that people can whistleblow, that they can spot where something might be sanctioned, are so, so important to ensuring that companies um, remain the right side of the line. And who polices financial sanctions? Well, as I've said, over in the US, you'll find it's OFAC, uh, in the UK, we have Offsea, 
um, and individual states um, within the European Union will we'll do it in different ways. Overall, you have the Directorate General for Financial Stability at the head of that. Now, moving on, common question, um, and I've only got a couple more points, is can I get a license so that I can just, you know, deal with a sanctioned entity? The idea that there might be a license out there which is easily achievable for most clients tends to be a, a bit of a mirage, okay? So um, under the US, under the UK, under the EU rules, it is possible to get licenses to permit certain transactions with designated entities, but uh, they do not, as a rule, tend to be for commercial transactions, day-to-day um, -day things. So if you were a family member and you wanted to provide some support um, to a sanctioned individual, you might be able to get a license for that. Um, you might be able to get um, licenses for uh, payments of court fees. Uh, a, a sanctioned individual might be able to pay out certain debts with a license, but we're talking about really, really um, narrow categories. And broadly speaking, if your proposition is, I want to enter into a transaction which involves a, a sanctioned person, what OFSI is going to say when you go to them is, is no, they are sanctioned for a purpose. It's an asset freeze. No money should go to them. No money should go come from them. And that for most of the things that um, our clients are interested in is the ultimate answer. Time is um, running out for me on this. You're going to hear um, uh, from Anton a bit more about sectoral sanctions. But again, just coming back to something that Alf said, um, this is a great example of where sanctions will apply to certain activities, but not to others. And particularly, and this is the thing that comes up a lot in relation to banks. So under both, uh, well, all of EU, UK and US sanctions, there are these san san uh, sectoral sanctions, which are aimed to restrict, aimed to restrict the access of Russian state-owned banks to capital markets. And so there will be certain transactions you cannot enter into with these Russian banks, for, which will relate to certain money market instruments and also the making of credit uh, facilities of more than, say, 30 days to those banks. Now, but if the question is, does that mean I can't uh, transact with these banks at all in any other capacity? The answer to that is no. So the devil will be in the detail. If you find that a bank or that's also certain energy companies, which are also subject to these sectoral restrictions. So if you find you're dealing with someone with an entity which is uh, subject to those, don't despair, work out what it is you want to do with them and whether these very specific uh, sanctions will actually prevent you from doing that. You're going to be hearing more about it, but I just wanted to plant the seed before um, you hear later. This is just the introduction. Crimea Sevastopol, again, briefly. I mean, this is an example of really quite wide ranging um, sanctions by the EU and the same apply in the, in the UK. Um, and as you'll see from the examples that I've given there, if you're an EU or UK entity or national wanting to transact in Crimea, in Sevastopol, you would have severe difficulties. So the importing into the EU or UK of goods originating in Crimea is prohibited. There are all types of other uh, prohibitions relating to investment in land and shares. You can't have joint ventures. Um, but that is something where, again, if you wanted to do any business there, 
you would have to get very specific uh, advice. So that is a more wide ranging, albeit quite targeted set of measures. And so while I hope at the end of this introduction, you are just waiting for more from the, this great panel of speakers, but that you now feel comfortable with the basics of sanctions. Sanctions regimes, as you'll have been seeing, it's not just one sanctions regime, there are a whole number. And it's quite possible that within your own organization, you will find that different individuals, a US individual, a UK individual, an EU individual, will be subject to different sanctions regimes. So they overlap. You have to take a holistic view. And the way that most businesses deal with this is essentially to have policies in place which um, allow for screening of your counterparts, which make people aware of how sanctions work so that you can catch where you've got a problem. So for example, you wouldn't want a US individual dealing with anything to do with Iran or Cuba. Thank you. And um, finally, I would say sanctions are ever changing. It's become a board level matter. And as you will see, as, as, as we go on today, they impinge on all areas, including litigation and arbitration, as well as transactions. And with that, I bring my introduction to a close. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, we now, we overrun slightly. So we now over directly to Anton Fedotov, uh, director of KPMG Law, which is a legal arm of KPMG. And Anton will be talking about US, EU and UK financial sanctions and key differences and impact on Russia, UK businesses, importantly. And Anton and the rest of the speakers may ask you to follow the timeline, please. Anton, you have 20 minutes and there will be a little warning be uh, behind the scenes two minutes before the end of the time. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you all for joining this uh, webinar. Thank you very much, Greg, for a brilliant introduction <clears throat> and the overview of, of the sanctions regimes. It's, I think it's very helpful. Uh, well, um, let's start. Uh, I will start with the um, general overview of the US, UK and EU sanctions. Uh, sanctions, uh, as you have heard, uh, could be sectoral and blocking sanctions, so-called asset freezes. Let's start with sectoral sanctions of the US. These sanctions were introduced by uh, the president's executive order in 2014 and uh, these sanctions must be complied by so-called US persons and which are uh, US nationals, permanent residents uh, of the US, uh, any entities uh, and, and <clears throat> organizations organized under the laws of the EU or any uh, jurisdiction within the United States, including their foreign overseas branches, <clears throat> and also persons uh, that have any, any, any activity, any business conduct uh, on the territory of the United States. What is prohibited? Um, as you've heard, uh, sectoral sanctions uh, uh, do not uh, prohibit any transactions with the sanctioned person, but they target uh, certain, uh, certain activities, certain transactions, uh, which could be, um, could be related to, which are related to uh, various sectors of the Russian economy, uh, uh, like uh, oil sector and financial sector. Uh, the sectoral sanctions of the ES are set out in four directives and these directives provide um, specific prohibitions that um, U.S. persons must, must comply with. So, for example, uh, Directive 2 imposes a prohibition on making uh, transactions involving so-called new debt of a sanctioned person. New debt means, um, for example, loan or credit, which means that if you're a U.S. person, you cannot grant a loan to, uh, to, uh, to a sanctioned person. The sanctioned persons are listed uh, in the so-called sectoral sanctions identification list, SSI list. I think I've heard about the, uh, you have heard about this. Blocking sanctions. Um, these sanctions were also introduced in, in, in 2014 and um, persons that must uh, comply with the sanctions are the same as those that must uh, adhere to the uh, sectoral sanctions. And um, as opposed to sectoral sanctions, blocking sanctions uh, prohibit uh, actually any dealings with the sanctioned 
uh, person any dealings uh, with uh, uh, with the sanctioned person's uh, property assets are also prohibited. The sanctioned persons are listed in the so-called SDN list, a uh, list of specially designated nationals and blocked persons. It's very important to know that uh, US sanctions, uh, as well as UK and EU sanctions, and you will see, as you will see later on, apply not only to the listed persons, i.e. those who are on the list, but also to their affiliates, if uh, certain criteria are met. As to the US sanctions, um, they apply uh, to, to, to listed persons and also to entities which are owned in the aggregate directly and directly for 50% or more by a sanctioned listed person. This is the so-called 50% rule. And um, it is important to note that uh, for the purposes of the US sanctions, it does not matter, it does not matter whether an entity is controlled by, um, by a listed person. Only, um, only ownership, 50% uh, or more, uh, matters. This is in contrast to the, to the EU and UK sanctions regimes, as, as, as you will hear. Uh, secondary sanctions. Uh, <clears throat> these are considered to be the most dangerous ones. And um, it, is, it is true to say that they're quite dangerous, they're quite tricky. Uh, sectoral, uh, secondary sanctions um, have existed for over two decades, but um, with regard to uh, Russia, uh, they, uh, uh, they were introduced only in 2017 by the countering America's adversaries through Sanctions Act. And uh, secondary sanctions um, apply to non-US persons. So in other words, non-US persons can be punished by uh, secondary sanctions, even though such persons have no connection with the US. An example of secondary sanction is um, Section 228 of CATSA. CATSA is, uh, is, the, is the statute which introduced uh, secondary sanctions against Russia. And under this Section 228, uh, the United States President is obliged to impose uh, an asset blocking sanction, which means uh, an asset freeze, on any foreign person that materially violates, attempts to violate, conspires to violate, or causes violation of US sanctions imposed on Russia. Or if uh, such a foreign, i.e. non-US person, facilitates a significant transaction for any person which is subject to sanctions. What this means, <clears throat> this um, effectively means that if you are, for example, UK or Russian or EU company, and you um, are going to uh, enter into any more or less major transaction with the uh, sanctioned person, for example, person who is on the um, blocking sanctions list as the list of the US, then uh, you uh, should understand that uh, you risk being uh, included in the SDN list itself. So in other words, if you, uh, if you meet either of these criteria, material violate or uh, facilitate significant transaction for a sanctioned person, then you, you can be uh, punished by the sector of sanctions and you can be made a blocked person yourself. And the practical implications of secondary sanctions are that um, uh, any non-US persons who um, are considering any transactions, any transactions with Russian persons uh, should, uh, should uh, seek legal advice uh, to understand whether they uh, have any, any risks um, uh, caused by the secondary sanctions. Because as I said, uh, the the risk of being included in the SDN list is is a huge one, and I will have major um, um, implications if it realizes. Um, EU sanctions, sectoral sanctions of the of the uh, European Union. These were introduced by the Council Regulation 2014. Uh, uh, the sectoral sanctions must be complied uh, with by nationals of uh, EU member states, legal entities incorporated under the laws of EU member state, and any person uh, who uh, has any, any business on the territory of any of the EU member states. Sectoral sanctions, again, they are not blocking sanctions. They target specific areas. They, they target specific uh, sectors of the Russian economy. And um, 
um, they uh, prohibit certain transactions with certain individuals and entities uh, that are included in 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 the list. Uh, the list is set out in annexes. Lists are set out in annexes to the council regulation. On this slide, on this slide, I set out the prohibitions imposed by sectoral sanctions in detail. Just <clears throat> to sum up, as you can see, um, one of the prohibition is it is prohibited to purchase, sell, or otherwise deal with transferable securities or other money market instruments of a sanctioned person, which means that, for example, you cannot um, uh, buy uh, bond or shares issued by a sanctioned person. And also you cannot make or be part of any arrangement to make new loans or facility to sanctioned person, which means that you cannot uh, grant a loan to sanctioned person or uh, or be any in directly or indirectly part of, 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 of arranging such a loan for the sanctioned person. Um, then blocking sanctions of the EU. These were also introduced in 2014 and uh, uh, the same uh, persons that must comply with the sectoral sanctions must comply with the blocking sanctions, so-called EU persons. And um, blocking sanctions are basically asset freezes, so uh, they, they, they block a sanctioned person and its assets and um, um, they uh, prohibit uh, to make any funds or economic resources available to sanctioned persons directly and directly and also they prohibit to deal with uh, with uh, funds and economic resources of a sanctioned person. Uh, the sanctioned persons are designated, um, are not sorry, not designated, um, they, are, um, um, they are listed in the uh, council regulation and uh, today uh, there are 160 individuals and 41 legal entities, organizations, self-governing territories, etc. on this list. Um, again, a very important thing to mention is affiliates uh, to which uh, blocking sanctions and sectoral sanctions of the EU may apply. Um, sectoral and blocking sanctions of the European Union um, apply to entities which are owned directly and directly for more than 50% by a sanctioned listed person or controlled by a sanctioned listed person. Um, which means that um, both ownership, more than 50% and control matter for the purpose of determining whether your counterparty is uh, a sanctioned indirectly person. Again, by contrast, as you, as you I think remember, under the sanctions regime, control does not matter. And here control does matter. The key sanctions, um, sectoral sanctions. They were introduced by, uh, uh, in relation to Russia, they were introduced by two statutes, sanctions and anti-money laundering act and Russia sanctions EU exit regulations. Uh, these sanctions must be achieved to by UK nationals, wherever they are in the world, in the world then bodies, organizations, uh, uh, legal entities and cooperated or constituted under the law of any part of the UK, including foreign uh, non-UK branches, and any person with respect to their activities in the UK. Um, as with the US and EU sanctions, UK sectoral sanctions target specific transactions, they prohibit specific activities, they, uh, they uh, deal with specific entities uh, which are listed in um, in the regulation. So, for example, uh, it is prohibited uh, to deal with transferable security money market, money market instruments uh, issued by uh, sanctioned persons. So, in other words, you cannot, for example, buy or sell uh, um, uh, bonds again or, uh, or any other financial instruments of uh, sanctioned persons. Uh, blocking uh, sanctions. Um, I think uh, the UK in the UK, uh, the word blocking is not used as well as in the EU, but uh, just for my purposes, I call them blocking because the effect is, is to block a sanctioned person. Once again, uh, these sanctions uh, were introduced by the same statutes as uh, sectoral sanctions. Uh, they, they must be complied with by the same UK persons as uh, UK persons that must uh, comply with the sectoral sanctions. And uh, they uh, prohibit, 
uh, to deal with funds and economic resources owned, held, or controlled by a sanctioned person, <clears throat> the so-called asset freeze. And also, they uh, it is not allowed to uh, provide funds and, and resources, economic resources, to a sanctioned uh, person. In other words, the sanctioned, uh, the uh, blocking sanctions have the same effect as uh, as uh, the US and EU blocking sanctions, which means that uh, a sanctioned person and its assets are blocked and it's not allowed to deal with them at all. The um, sanctioned persons are designated by the UK government uh, and included in the UK sanctions list. Affiliates, again, uh, UK sectoral and blocking sanctions apply not only to listed persons, but also to their affiliates, um, which are owned directly and directly for more than 50% by a sanctioned listed person or controlled by such a sanctioned listed person. Again, uh, as with the um, EU sanctions regime, uh, when it comes to UK sanctions, uh, both ownership, more than 50%, and control matter. And as I said before, this is in in sharp contrast to the UK, uh, US sanctions, sorry, US sanctions. Then key differences. Uh, there are a lot of differences, but major differences, I think, are these two. As I previously said many times, um, under the US 50% rule, um, it does not matter whether or not an entity is controlled by a sanctioned person. On the ownership, the 50% rule uh, matters. Uh, but at the same time, OFAC, uh, which, as you know, uh, uh, is responsible for uh, enforcing US sanctions, uh, has issued uh, guidelines, uh, gu guidelines uh, according to which, even though um, an entity uh, which is controlled by a listed person is not automatically treated as a um, uh, blocked person, it may become a blocked person in the future. This is because uh, it is controlled by a listed person and the fact will uh, will look at it uh, entity in more detail so that in the future, such a, a non-listed entity may become subject to blocking sanctions. And um, uh, the second um, uh, difference is that uh, the US sanctions regime provides for secondary sanctions and luckily uh, there is no such regime under uh, uh, the UK and uh, EU sanctions laws. Um, differences between EU sanctions and UK sanctions again, the regimes as Greg said are quite similar but uh, they still have differences. And uh, first uh, thing to, to mention is that uh, the sanctions lists are, are, are similar, but, not, but are not the same. Second, uh, the regimes uh, use different definitions. For example, as you, as you can remember, um, uh, under the um, EU sanctions regime, um, a rebuttable presumption of ownership and control is used if um, an entity uh, is controlled or owned by a listed person. Uh, and in this case, it is presumed that an asset that you provide to uh, a non-listed uh, person uh, will go to the listed person. And in this sense, it is prohibited to deal, uh, to deal with a non-listed person or with assets or provide assets to the non-listed person if such a non-listed person is controlled or um, or owned or for, 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 uh, for more than 50% by a listed person. But at the same time, it is presumption, so it can, it can be rebutted, which means that you can, you can provide arguments and in theory can even, even provide assets to a non-listed person which is controlled by a listed person if you can, uh, if you can uh, provide evidence that the assets will not ultimately go to the uh, blocked uh, listed person. And by contrast, under the UK sanctions regime, there is no such a rebuttable presumption. There is just a strict rule that once the criteria for ownership and control are met, uh, the blocking sanctions will automatically apply to the non-listed person. And it is uh, in this way, it is very similar to the uh, to how the 50% rule in the in the US works. Automatic. Uh, and third bit is. Um, EU and UK subsidiaries uh, may now be caught by sectoral sanctions. Um, 
This is because uh, under the um, EU sectoral um, uh, regime, um, sectoral sanctions um, apply to more than 50% owned non-EU subsidiaries of listed persons. And this means that such sectoral sanctions do not apply to more than 50% owned EU subsidiaries and that such, such sectoral sanctions do apply to more than 50% owned UK subsidiaries because the UK is no longer part of the EU. And the similar carve-out exists in the UK and again UK sectoral sanctions do not apply to UK subsidiaries owned by listed persons but they do apply now, do apply to, uh, to EU subsidiaries because again the UK is no longer part of the EU. Um, and uh, uh, the last the last slide um, is just about the things that um, any businesses should bear in mind if they are to deal with uh, Russian businesses uh, or within uh, the EU and UK. First of all, uh, be aware that the US secondary sanctions are very dangerous, they're very tricky and they apply to non-US persons, e.g. they can apply to UK or Russian businesses even, even if they have no nexus, no connection with the, with the US itself. Uh, second, uh, it is advisable to carefully check sanctions lists of the US, EU and the UK and never assume, never assume that the EU and uh, the UK sanctions lists are the same. They are not. Um, if you or your, um, or your consultants um, um, are going to do EU or UK sanctions due diligence, uh, be aware that the EU and UK sanctions, as I said, are quite similar in general, but major differences, major crucial differences are found in details, like, as you remember, the example of the uh, rebuttable presumption. And the last bit, the last point is about uh, EU and UK subsidiaries. Uh, just check whether uh, the EU and UK subsidiaries of listed persons uh, with whom you may want to deal are uh, now caught by sectoral sanctions. That's it. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much for that, Anton. That was um, very sour. And I think preempting the, one of the questions we have from the audience is that we will, uh, hopefully with the help of the speakers, we'll distribute the presentations because that was definitely a lot of material to go through. But uh, hopefully, as you would see, um, very, uh, very thorough analysis is needed for uh, companies who set out to do international trade and that's hugely helpful. Thank you so much and specifically stay, stay, sticking to the time as well, much appreciated. Um, I now have a pleasure to give um, a uh, part to speak over to David Goldberg, uh, who is a partner at an international firm White and & Case and David um, is really one of the leading experts, I think, on arbitration. So it's a real pleasure to have him here with us. And he will talk about, um, which I think will be interesting to a lot of uh, participants here, um, especially looking at the arbitrations um, in terms of the arrange commercial arrangements is how sanctions uh, affect the arbitrations. And David will give some practical advice David, over to you. You have 15 minutes and you will have a warning two minutes in, ad in advance before it runs out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Svetlana. Um, and um, thank you, organizers, for inviting me to this um, interesting event. It is eye-opening, even though I try to look into the sanctions generally. And, um, well, hearing the presentations today, um, it appears to me to be as clear as mud. Um, <laughs> I, I um, still do not understand how you navigate between all this um, uh, sectoral blocking, um, controlling um, subsidiaries, etc. What um, is important um, from my point of view is how the um, sanctions um, affect dispute resolution. As a dispute resolution lawyer, I will try to um, look into this question in the next um, 15 minutes or so. When the Russian sanctions were first introduced in 2014, um, initially there were serious concerns that they could significantly impede Russia-related arbitrations. Then, 
the pendulum swung in the other direction. And it was being said that sanctions did not have any strong effect on dispute resolution involved in Russian parties. Because again, when you have a dispute, you don't necessarily provide um, financial benefit, you don't make payments, etc. Um, during the dispute as such, or at least in normal um, studies of the dispute. Now, after six years, it appears that um, we are moving to a slightly different direction. And again, um, the scope of various sanctions regime is expanding, as is increasing the complexity of the regulatory framework and compliance. And this is not necessarily true only for the Russian related sanctions. There is a degree of frustration associated with the adverse effect of sanctions on the resolution of disputes with the Russian element. One might say that this is precisely the intended effect of sanctions. Well, I would leave it up to the audience to firm a view on this, but let us see what sanctions mean for dispute resolution from a practical point of view. There have been cases in all institutions, including the LCIA, where the institution had difficulties in appointing arbitrators, providing bank details and receiving deposits from a sanctioned or listed or whatever entity at the beginning of the dispute. It takes significant effort to run every party against numerous sanctions in place in different countries and then ensure that neither the institution nor the arbitrators nor even lawyers are in breach of sanctions in one or another country. So as an institution, we have to run uh, parties against various sanctions in Australia, Russian sanctions, Ukrainian sanctions, um, EU sanctions, et cetera, et cetera, before a decision can be made. And um, it was mentioned that um, in the previous presentations and in the introduction, that there is a lot of confusion as well. And that is a big problem. So banks in the UK very often would try to be cautious and um, will not accept funds even when there is no legal basis for them to refuse accepting funds. When um, the entities are not on the list, not designated, not subsidiaries, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, i.e., sanctions do not apply to these entities. I recently experienced an ironic situation when a party could not make a payment into court pursuant to the court's order. In a well-known public dispute involving Russia and former share shareholders of Yukos oil company, um, there was yet another court application, which the uh, shareholders of Yukos uh, lost. Um, as it is normal rule that um, cost follow event in English litigation. The court ordered uh, costs to be paid um, or awarded costs um, to the Russian Federation and made an order for interim payment into court. For different reasons, there had to be made payments into court. So just over a million pounds had to be paid into court. And um, Ironically, the um, Her Majesty's Court Service Costs Office could not accept the funds simply because the bank that provides accounts for the High Court in London thought that there might be <clears throat> some problems in relation to accepting funds which potentially would go to Russia. It took few weeks to explain that Russia is not a designated entity itself. So there is quite a lot of confusion there. And um, uh, sometimes it gets to uh, ironic and, um, well, strange situations. Now, <clears throat> the effect is that in London, we as dispute resolution lawyers see that some disputes um, may go to Asian institutions. Well, again, I personally do not agree that going to Asia would resolve the or, or all problems associated with arbitrating 
um, involving parties that are designated or somehow concerned with sanctions. Um, I suspect that there are still the same problems in terms of arbitrators, EU nationals or UK nationals or US nationals arguably cannot be appointed and serve as arbitrators involving sanctioned entities. Then also payments into uh, court or arbitral institution, deposits, same problem, especially if the payments are in US dollars. Then also the banks servicing those institutions are likely to be Western banks anyway. But uh, the Asian institutions are actively now promoting themselves as not affected by Western sanctions. And therefore, I must admit that some disputes um, do go to Asia now, I mean, Russia-related disputes. And um, we see that increasingly Russian parties insert arbitration agreements into their contracts, referring to Singapore or Hong Kong arbitration, where prior to sanctions, these agreements would typically refer to disputes um, resolved by the LCA. Here I have some recent cases on which I'm not going to concentrate for the sake of time, which illustrate how Western courts dealt with parties that were subject to sanctions. I can just mention the last case, the um, Iranian case, which was here in the UK. And um, it is interesting that um, a judgment or what, well, an award, an arbitral award, could not be enforced because of sanctions. And then typically, if there is a delay in enforcing or payment under the award, then uh, there is um, a post-award interest. And uh, the English court decided that because of the sanctions, the interest should stop um, running. So, it is an interesting um, decision in my view, and it illustrates potential problems with enforcement. In the remaining time, I'm going to um, concentrate on what I consider to be a very interesting development in Russia. And um, this development affects even further any disputes involving Russian parties. From the cases um, that we've seen, or from the cases that we do see, I think it is still possible to arbitrate outside of Russia uh, with Russian or Russian-related parties um, where there are sanctions involved. But um, what happens now with this new law that has been introduced makes me even less optimistic when it comes to disputes involving Russian parties. First, there is no publicly available comprehensive information on how frequently Russian parties are unable to arbitrate or litigate outside of Russia because of sanctions. However, it follows from the limited amount of information that is available that um, it does happen from time to time. In response to difficulties faced by Russian parties who were unable to arbitrate or litigate outside of Russia, and in light of various sanctions regimes, in June 2020, Russia enacted important amendments to its commercial procedural code. In a nutshell, these amendments permit parties affected by sanctions to submit their disputes to Russian courts. This is achieved through the new rules on the so-called exclusive jurisdiction of Russian courts, which can be asserted if, one, there is no arbitration or choice of court agreement, and an identical dispute is not already pending before a foreign court or tribunal, and two, there is a valid agreement to arbitrate or litigate outside of Russia, but it becomes unenforceable as a result of sanctions created, creating obstacles um, for access to justice. Well, when these circumstances exist, a sanctioned party is entitled to apply to a Russian commercial court 
either to have its claim resolved on the merits or to obtain an anti-suit injunction prohibiting foreign proceedings. Exclusive jurisdiction extends to disputes involving sanctioned entities and disputes arising from Russia-related sanctions. From practical perspective, it is um, <clears throat> the provision regarding obstacles that has raised the biggest concerns as potentially ambiguous. In this regard, the law gives the courts wide discretion. The practical impact of the new rules is therefore be largely determined by Russian courts' interpretation of obstacles or um, of for access to justice. There are a number of other open questions, for example, whether Russian courts' decisions based on the new rules will be enforceable outside of Russia. In any event, this regulation, these regulations added complexity in international deals involving Russian parties. Um, there is a case um, that is pending in the Supreme Court. And um, this case, in my view, is changing the scene. The most prominent example is this case, and it is um, Ural Transmash, a Russian rail car manufacturer. In this case, the Russian courts initially refused to grant an anti-suit injunction to hold a Stockholm arbitration brought against Ural Transmash by a Polish entity called PESA. The dispute concerned a contract concluded in 2013. In 2014, Ural Zavod, the parent company of Ural Transmash, became subject to EU and US sanctions. In 2019, PESA commenced an arbitration against Ural Transmash, claiming damages. At the outset, Ural Transmash was taking part in the arbitration. However, after the Russian anti-sanctions law came into effect, it applied to the Russian court seeking an anti-suit injunction against PESA. The Russian courts found that being subject to sanctions was in itself insufficient for obtaining an injunction, quite rightly. They noted that Ural Transmash had, as a matter of fact, actively participated in the Stockholm arbitration for more than two years and was represented by reputable Russian and Polish lawyers. Accordingly, the courts concluded that there were no obstacles impending Ural Transmash access to justice. This meant that the question of whether there are obstacles are fact specific. This original decision of the Russian Supreme Court dated May 2021, and its um, balanced approach was welcomed by the Russian arbitration community. However, in September 2021, the Russian Supreme Court decided to reconsider this decision. In its ruling, remanding the case for further review, the Supreme Court suggested that the very fact of an entity becoming subject to any sanctions may be sufficient to conclude that its access to justice has been impaired. The Supreme Court also observed that the introduction of sanctions driven by uh, police considerations cannot be uh, cannot but raise doubts as to whether the proceedings in the territory of the state that has imposed sanctions would be concluded in accordance with the principles of fair trial. This case is ongoing. The hearing is scheduled for today. Um, there is a likelihood that Supreme Court may uphold this restrictive approach that I have just outlined. If this happens, it may well have far-reaching consequences. Such a broad interpretation of the new anti-sanctions law may mean that an entity that becomes subject to any sanctions may be entitled to disregard, from a Russian law standpoint, any dispute, <coughs> resolution provision, any um, uh, arbitration agreement. And there is no need to prove that the sanctioned party is, as a matter of fact, unable to use the dispute resolution mechanism provided by the contract. Apart from affecting the existing international contracts, this may also result in foreign counterparties asking for additional collateral as a condition to enter into new transactions with Russian parties. Some businesses may become more reluctant to transact with Russian parties altogether or to refuse to deal with them 
To sum up, the upcoming court decision may lead to a significant change in the landscape of international trade. Thank you so much, David, for that. And I think it's what it... Thank you. Give at least as a takeaway for me is that it's um, apart from um, a change in landscape um, and looking at the consequences of uh, sanctions and arbitrations and how they collide, is to also look at the places to choose arbitration uh, specifically in relation to how well the legal system inside the country supports the arbitrations and doesn't give a leeway to challenge them even further. I think that's that's an interesting point um uh to consider as well and uh now we move into i think the the question which came on the surface in the previous presentation was that how does anyone how does the business actually comply and finds a way to comply with all these multiple requirements and um it's a pleasure to um to introduce andre by who is a partner at uh, cordary compliance and it's a specialized compliance firm who are the people who look after how to ensure one complies. And uh, I think it would be great for uh, Andre to share his experience on how due diligence, sanctions, policy and slavery issues actually dealt with by uh, businesses in reality. Andre, over to you. You have 15 minutes and two minutes warning before that. Thank you. Thank you, Svetlana. Can you hear me? Yes. Over. OK, and can someone get the slides up, please? Great, thank you very much. Yes, yes, uh, my particular aspect, as has been said, uh, is to deal with compliance issues. And as you heard from our first speaker, it's very important that you have proper compliance, robust compliance in place to help you deal with these issues. Compliance means basically having those processes and procedures in place that can help you make sure that one, you know, the most important thing, you don't fall foul of the rules, because as you've heard, under the different regimes, there can be significant uh, penalties involved. And as the first speaker said, this is very much an issue about um, training as well and oversight and so on. And so what I'm going to talk about for the main part is having a sanctions policy in place, um, how that can help you, and as kind of sub themes there, I'm going to talk a little bit about red flags, looking for, you know, danger signs, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're doing your research. Um, and as part of this due diligence, risk assessment and so on, there's the screening aspect. You've heard, re you've heard references to the various lists. That's very important to look in those, I'll mention that. And really the modern slavery thing at the end is just a kind of afterthought, um, a sort of bit of, blue sky thinking for the future because as our first speaker said sanctions is an ever moving thing um, you know it could be that tomorrow there's a new set of sanctions on an individual uh, or different entity and so on it's a it's a constantly moving target so sanctions policy well why would you want to have in place a sanctions policy well as I've indicated the prime reason you would want to have this is to stop any breaches of sanctions. You don't want your business, your individuals breaching those various sanctions regimes, because as you've heard, there can be severe penalties there. And you want to make sure that that's a continuing exercise. A policy is not just a question of having a piece of paper in the drawer. It's something that you have to actively work on uh, in terms of when you're getting inquiries from individuals who who want to do business with you and so on. This is very much about managing risk. You know, it's how to help you manage that sanctions compliance risk. And unfortunately, as with so many things, it may be that your staff are the weak link, that they may miss something. They may not do their due diligence sufficiently. Um, and this is why, as our first speaker said, training is very important and oversight, you know, from particularly from the top level of management, very, very important. Um, so having that policy, and I'm going to explain a bit more about that in a moment, is very useful. Uh, as I say, the key thing is to prevent you getting into trouble, but also it might help you mitigate your situation in case you do get into trouble. But I need to be very clear 
the policy isn't Harry Potter with his magic wand, it doesn't mean that you've got the policy in place that the regulator isn't going to fine you. That might stop, not stop that. But as I say, it might help you in terms of mitigating issues if there are problems. If you could say, well, we had everything in place, we trained the individual, we did everything that we could to prevent the problem, but unfortunately the problem still happened. So as I say, it could help you mitigate, but it's not necessarily your, your get out of jail card, as it were. So I've put here a, a few suggestions of the sorts of things you could put in your policy. This doesn't have to be a big document. It can be just a few pages. In fact, I would say the more succinct and meaningful you can make it, the better, because, particularly because the policy will be aimed at people who are not like us lawyers. You won't want it in over sophisticated legalistic type language. You want it for everybody to understand so that they appreciate that there are issues here that they are also responsible. And you need to make it clear to people that it applies to all staff. Um, I'm not saying that every single individual in the business might be involved in a sanctions issue, but you need to make it clear that, you know, it applies to you. You're here to protect our business. Um, so you need to be aware of these issues. And then you need to put in a basic explanation of what sanctions are. We've heard some very clear explanations from our other speakers about what they are. Um, but as we have also, I think, has come clear, it's uh, confusing areas. People confuse, as, 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 as one speaker said, a whole trade embargo on a country with particular sanctions on an individual. So you need to just set out and explain in very simple language what these sanctions are. And then you need to explain, you know, what are those consequences? As I said, it could be very damaging for a business, for an organization. It could be fines, it could be going to prison, and of course it could be very serious reputational damage as well. And I think as part of that policy, you need to, need to make it absolutely clear that you have zero tolerance, that you can't be doing business with sanctioned individuals or sanctioned entities. Now, something that hasn't been touched on, and I don't really have the time to go in great detail, but certainly under the UK rules, there are uh, certain reporting issues. But let me be clear, the first issue is that if someone is doing their due diligence in your organisation and they come across an issue, they should report internally, immediately. There should be a very clear line within the business, someone senior who they have to report to to say, I've spotted a red flag, I think there's a problem here, you know, what do we do next? And then those senior people should be able to, you know, deal with that, say what they do. As I say, it could involve getting external advice or external service providers to do further checks or whatever. But it may also be that, as I said, under UK law, for certain entities, they have to report to the regulator and they have to do that very quickly. So they have people have to be aware that if they spot a problem, it's like having if you have a fire in the building, help, there's a fire you know, act quickly, can't stop the fact, can't have the fire spreading, do something quickly, because it may be that we have to, as I say, for certain entities, report to a regulator. Make sure you keep records. Again, you've got to get that message in the policy. You've got to document everything you're doing. There's got to be a very clear paper trail for doing your, your due diligence and your searches. And I say a key part of your policy is the messaging as well. Um, make sure that people feel that they're not alone, that, um, if they're not sure about something, call for help. You know, as, a, as we've said, we've indicated there can be serious uh, consequences for infringements here. So call for help if, you, if you're not sure about something. And then you need to get support from the, from the board. Tone from the top is very important. And uh, as was mentioned by our first speaker, there may be other things you might want to mention in the policy, like there can be licensing. You can get licenses in certain issue, in certain areas. And also, let's not forget, there are also sometimes some exemptions from the sanctioned rules as well. So people need to be aware of those that that might exist. So you might think I found an individual who's sanctioned or an entity rather. Um, are there any exemptions that might apply here in this given situation? And as I've said, you want to look out for red flags. Uh, again, you could put these in your policy. I've just I've got two slides. I'll go th through these quite quickly um, because when you're doing your inquiries, you, you will want to make sure that the person who you're going to be dealing with um, is who they say they are, that they're not acting on behalf of someone else and so on. 
So you should have, I say that this is the useful thing in your sanctions policy. It's a kind of panic sheet as well. These are the sorts of questions you can ask. And if you have suspicions, for example, the customer's reluctant to offer information about the end use of an item, or they won't give you clear answers to what seem to be routine commercial or technical questions, or they give you unconvincing explanations about um, technical requirements, or they say, no, no, don't worry about these routine installation issues, or particularly obviously be careful around the money issues. Um, maybe they're certainly offering you fantastic money for what they want to do, or they give you want to give you lump sum cash payments and so on. And then there are a few other things here. Sometimes people will say, we'll try and give you unusual shipping, packaging or label arrangements that they want, um, or maybe the installation site where something is going to be sent um, is under some kind of strict controls. People can't have access to it or they have very unusual requirements for a confidentiality with the clients, obviously very, very important, but maybe, maybe something seems a little bit excessive to you. And now, obviously my examples here have been very much about products. Um, you can adapt these questions. Um, you can come up with lists that are appropriate to sort of the type of business that you're involved in, uh, as I say, to put those in the policy so that you've got that kind of immediate, uh, what I, as I say, called Kind of panic list of things checklist of things that you can have to hand um, when you're doing that due diligence now the screening as we've heard is very important um, in terms of looking at those lists you've heard references to lots of different lists we have the the, the, the uk lists of you as you've heard and you'll want to do that screening very early on at the start of what hopefully will be a new beautiful relationship with a new client particularly doing that uh, screening with third parties as well. As we've said, in the UK, the most basic level of screening, and I do emphasize basic level of screening, will be checking against those lists. So there are easily accessible, you can find them very quickly, um, websites, government, UK government websites that give you those lists of people um, with the names. Sometimes you get things like passport numbers and so on. So that's your kind of starting point. Um, just a little bit of blue sky thinking again, let's say you hit the jackpot, the person or the entity isn't on the list. Um, you might want to think ahead. This is not unusual. I've had to deal with this where someone might say, well, they're not on the list, but you might try and work out if someone might get sanctioned. As our first speaker said, sanctions aren't move very quickly. Um, new people get put on the list. So you might want to do some extra due diligence on a person. You might want to look at like the press, you know, do a search through one of those typical uh, due diligence instruments to see what's been reported in the last five years, say about an individual that will be obviously English speaking press, but also obviously Russian speaking press and so on, Russian language press and so on. So you might want to do that extra little bit of due diligence. You know, you've got to think a bit like Sherlock Holmes sometimes when you're doing this, this, this exercise. It's not just simply looking at the basic list. As I say, you may need to do a little bit more as well. Now, again, this is very, very basic, but if you're looking at individuals, um, you need to consider, and I've just put some, the basics here, you know, where do they live? What are their addresses? Where were they born? The date of birth? What do they do? Who's associated with them? What's their source of wealth and so on? As I mentioned, certainly for the UK lists, you might find um, passport numbers, dates of birth, and so on. You might find some of that information there, but as I say, you might want to go that extra level and do that extra little bit of research to make sure that you are confident that the person who you're looking at uh, to do business with is not a sanctioned individual. And similarly with entities, when you're doing that due diligence homework, um, you have to look at things like, you know, where is the business located, which region uh, and so on. What's the type of business? This would be standard due diligence you'd probably be doing with your clients anyway, but obviously you're taking special care here um, when you're dealing with you know, areas where there are these sort of sanction sensitivities. And obviously you're looking at the directors of the company. And then the last one is really the, perhaps the trickiest one of all, that's about beneficial owners and shadow directors. And there you might want to really think about engaging a third party sort of specialist provider here to give to to do that research particularly in russia 
looking at that information to find out who you're doing you're going to be doing business with because as we've heard there are these particular rules about ownership and control so you have to be very very careful with that now matching is a particular issue you need to be a little bit careful with um, my name's Andre, 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 Andy, Andrew, and whatever you want to call me. I've got variations of my name. Um, I do, I've worked on issues involving the Middle East. As you can imagine, there are a lot of people called Mohammed there. Um, similarly, when you're looking obviously at Russian issues, you've got to think about the name. Um, you've got to make sure that, you know, the name matches. Uh, in, in UK parlance, we refer to the, the target match here. You know, that would be the exact name of that individual who who's on the list. Um, you, you, as you get variations on names, you will see in the in the English lists, they will put things in Cyrillic and English, and they may put variants of names that people are known under. As we all know, you know, an Alexander's a Sasha, a Maria's a Masha, and so on. They're, they're, they're these things you need to look around. Um, as I say, you may need to look further because there might not be a true match. Um, but if you're, you're looking at these, you have that particular issue about matching a name, um, make sure you keep a record of that and any decisions you make about. And as I say, if you've got a real ambiguity, you might want to get someone uh, externally to help you with looking at that particular issue. And then just finally, as I say, this is really a bit of blue sky thinking. As, as has been said, sanctions is an evolving issue particularly financial sanctions um, and something that's becoming a big issue just generally in compliance is the whole issue about modern slavery forced labor or what's called ES, ESG environmental and social governance human rights supply chain compliance it's really become a much bigger thing we've got rules in the UK there are rules in Australia and California and so on focused mainly on modern slavery but it's becoming much broader. We're probably going to see a big new EU law come out about this. That means you have to do all this due diligence on your supply chain. Why does this matter in sanctions? Well, just to give you an example, um, last, uh, yes, the, the UK imposed sanctions uh, not so long ago on a Chinese entity, as well as a number of individuals that, it, that to do with the sort of this whole issue about um, modern slavery which is obviously a human rights issue. So as I say, watch this space. I'm not saying China and Russia are the same, of course, very different places. Um, but as we've said, it, we've already seen this year, sanction, human rights sanctions are imposed on a number of Russian individuals. You know, what if this goes to another level at some point in the future? Um, so a bit of blue sky thinking there, but I think the, the, the point I'm trying to make is you need to keep a, a tab on these things. You need to follow these things because they're forever changing. Um, and there may be, say, not just other individuals, but themes in terms of sanctions that evolve in the future that you need to, to, to follow in order to make sure that you don't fall on the wrong side of things. I hope that gives you a few practical things to think about. Um, as I say, my, you can clearly understand my messages, put in place that policy, train your staff, do that regular due diligence and think ahead as well. So you may need to be doing a bit more of a blue, blue sky thinking Sherlock Holmes as well in terms of thinking about the future. Thank you, Svetlana. Andre, thank you so much. I think just to add for myself, um, as a person who goes through compliance for my film, I would say um, diligence, diligence and diligence. And the sanctions are very serious piece of legislation which one needs to comply and i think what we find you know it's about asking yourself question you can see a foreign passport for somebody who speaks russian you can see in that passport usually you will have a place of birth so one can safely assume they might have russian citizenship and then you get a international passport with a different name there was some um, tradition to call users mother's maiden names and we've seen that in the legal profession go by uh, that doesn't actually um, help you in terms of your vigilance so um, you, you do need to have robust procedures and more than that train people very well and I'm, um, I think on a, on a bigger scale to coming back to what um, Greg and Anton were saying also think about practicalities uh, if you enter in a contract and the person is not a sanctioned person uh, 
Do you have a provisions in your contract ensuring that should they become on the list, how do you dispose of that contract? Because that will end, end up being relevant in any, in, this, in any dispute resolution you will be coming after it. Um, and we've heard about how complex it might be uh, from David. So I think um, summing up, I would like to first of all thank you all the speakers. I thought that that was a very Sarah presentation and we had several questions about whether the slides will be available so I'm hoping our uh, speakers will kindly provide them uh, so we can send them after the presentations. We also had uh, several uh, questions from uh, from the audience. Um, we would probably not be able to get through all of the questions because we're running slightly late, but I was hoping that we can pick up at least some of them, uh, which um, I've thought um, uh, as in the, having the editorial discretion here, uh, the most interesting one and useful for the whole um, uh, of the audience he listening to us. So I think the first question, and uh, I would assume that it's probably Greg Anton and Andre mostly uh, will be focusing on, uh, how do UK uh, and European Union sanctions correlate after Brexit? Um, so uh, if any of our speakers want to pick up on that question, please. I don't yeah. think Greg is making uh, signs that he's prepared. I I'm prepared to answer it briefly. I don't want to take <laughs> Um Well, the, the two um, regimes are, of course, separate. Um, as I said in the presentation, at the time of Brexit, if we describe it as that, all of the existing then EU sanctions are basically subsumed into UK law. So there is a huge degree of overlap between the two. But um, the way to think about it, and this goes back to something our, our last speaker just said, is that if, you're, if, if you've got a, um, a, an organization, you'll have some individuals who are subject to UK sanctions because they are UK nationals. You'll have others who are subject to EU sanctions because they are EU nationals and you'll have others who are subject to both because they're both UK and EU nationals. So effectively, post-Brexit, you have got two separate systems. In practice, um, what a lot of companies will be doing is they'll be ensuring if they've got UK, EU um, activities that they are in compliance with both of those frameworks. And actually at the moment, because they're so, so similar, it, in in practice, there isn't too much difficulty with that. But um, I'll hand over to my colleagues if they've got anything to add to that. Okay, I think that probably was a um, answer we the audience was after. I think the second one was to do, and there was actually several questions about control, which uh, is interesting. And the question was that in terms of control. Um, how, how do you check that one has control? Is there is a definition? Can the board member be called as having control? Um, um, it's probably uh, something Anton talked about as well. Um, Anton, if you want to pick this one up. Yes, sure. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, obviously, if an entity is owned uh, for 50% or more, for, for say 80% by a listed person, uh, by definition, it's controlled by a listed person. But there are instances uh, where there is control, but there is no ownership. Uh, for example, um, an individual uh, has entered into an agreement, and an individual which is, uh, who is listed has entered uh, into an agreement uh, with the company, and under this agreement, uh, the individual has the right to appoint or remove the majority of board members of this company. And in this case, there would be control on the part of this uh, sanctioned individual with respect to this entity. And this is true for both UK and EU regimes. And uh, 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 a very thing to mention is that uh, control is a very broad term. And uh, there is no exhaustive, uh, exhaustive list of um, criteria for control. And for example, under the UK sanctions regime, uh, control means uh, uh, inter alia uh, the situation uh, where a sanctioned person may uh, directly or indirectly command the actions of the of the uh, 
of, of the third party, uh, not affiliate, just third party. So uh, in essence, uh, control is a very broad term. And if you have any sense that your counterparty can be controlled uh, by, uh, by a person listed under the EU or UK sanctions regimes, you must, of course, uh, have some uh, additional due diligence, additional checks, and maybe involve in external counsel for this. Understood. Thank you so much for that. Um, we also have a question about um, whether when the sanctions refer to family, it just means spouse and children, uh, but not parents or other relatives living together, because I think that's also important for the due diligence and the policies we've been talking about. Um, it might be, um, I think it's a very good question from the audience as well. Um, no, uh, when it comes to individuals, uh, the sanctions don't apply to those uh, whom they control. So, for example, if an individual is on the sanctioned list, uh, his wife or his, his brother are not treated as uh, sanctioned, uh, blocked persons as well. Understood. Thank you so much. And I think um, uh, we had several more technical questions which uh, we will forward in due course to the speakers. Uh, there were two questions which were um, in my head and one was to David was that is there is anything uh, he is a um, specialist in arbitration can recommend to watch, uh, to look at, um, specifically at the construction of a contract or beginning of arbitration, which might be helpful uh, to be vigilant about sanctions or might help the process? Well, I, um, I don't think there is any specific step that can be taken. Um, well, again, Greg may want to step in as well uh, and express his view, but um, in my view, um, there needs to be a well-drafted arbitration agreement, as always, um, so that uh, you don't add to well, further difficulties. But um, when it comes to sanctions, again, um, usually it is possible to arbitrate with a sanctioned entity. There is no breaching of sanctions by having a dispute. Um, the problem is deposits, etc. Arbitrators. Well, one needs to navigate, and it is still possible to arbitrate. The case that I referred to today may complicate it even further by the Russian counterparties being able to try to avoid arbitration agreements. Well, that's the reality we live in, and um, well, we seem to be spending more time on compliance than on doing business. But, well, here we are. Thank you, David. I think this is where, again, um, people like Andre come into because I think that's um, the ever, ever dry, ever lasting drive to make sure that the compliance becomes more streamlined and effectively communicated. I think with that, um, uh, I would like to uh, come to, to an end of our session and thank you, uh, each and every one of the speakers. I've thought that they have delivered very detailed level of information. So please do, um, as audience, please do take a, you benefit and use of their presentations because um, it's, uh, uh, from what I can see, very uh, quality information which may be helpful. And I think that's, um, as a general message, um, um, and I'm sure that uh, uh, we hope all the speakers concur that we want people to do business uh, between UK and Russia and we want them to do it well. And by doing it well, we want them to understand uh, not just English, but the Russian regulatory frameworks. We want them to be comfortable with what they do in a reputable business rather than finding that they are in trouble from their bank or another counterparty. Uh, and being vigilant, which I think is a main contributing factor to be an effective business which does worldwide and international trade. With that, thank you very much, everyone, and I hope you have the lovely rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.